Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to worship at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm Palmer Cantler, one of the associate pastors here at Church Street. This evening at 7 p.m., we invite you to join us for the third week in our summer lecture series. Dr. Joseph Reif will present in our parish hall and by webinar. His lecture is titled, The Eyes of Jesus Were Upon Her, The Advent of Clergy Women in Mississippi Methodism. More information can be found on our website. The link is on your screen. We will also be in mission together for our neighbors in South Knoxville as we contribute much needed school supplies for the upcoming school year. Our school supplies drive is next Sunday, August 1st, and you can bring those items to the Welcome Center on Sunday morning, or you can contact me to make a different arrangement. We have a tax-free holiday this Friday through Sunday, and many school supplies are available for purchase tax-free. Promotion Sunday and Blessing of the Backpacks is August 8th during our worship services. All students and teachers are invited to bring their backpacks to the nave in person or to join us online to receive a special blessing for the new school year. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship together. Please join me in our call to worship. Come, rest your spirits in the Lord. We come hungering and thirsting for God's word. This is a place of peace and hope where all may be fed and healed. Bring us to the time of healing. Come, place your trust in God who is always near you. Open our hearts, Lord, to hear your word and feel your presence. And now let us join together in our opening hymn, O Church of God United.
please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we have not loved you with all our being. In your kindness, you formed the world as one glorious, diverse, colorful place. In our stubbornness and sinful pride, we have distorted your intention for humanity and for all creation. As your church, we have often perpetuated the divisions Christ came to destroy. In your grace, forgive us and free us from the grip of sin. Help us to worship and serve you joyfully for the sake of the salvation of the entire world through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. All you who seek God and who have set your hope on Jesus Christ, hear this good news. We have received forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. As forgiven and beloved children of God, let us set our hope on Christ and live for the praise of his glory. Good morning. I'd like to invite all the children to gather up, get comfy, and listen up. So today in our scripture, we're still in the book of Ephesians, and so Paul's still writing to the Ephesians. Um, and in this part of the book that we're at, he is saying a prayer for the church, but also for the people there. And in this prayer, he's telling them that they should ask and praying for that the Holy Spirit come and help give them strength and that they always have Christ in their heart to love those around them and that maybe that they get a chance to see God's amazing, wonderful power around them through everyday life. And so I challenge you all this week to come up with your own prayer for your family for this week, but also come up for a prayer for our church for this week. And it can be as simple as just saying, God, we are so thankful that we live um, and are able to worship you. And we just ask that we can see you every day. Or it can be more detailed and specific. Maybe you have um, a trip coming up and you need to pray for safe travels or Maybe you've started back to school or about to, and you're a little nervous about school starting back, and so you ask for comfort. So come up with a prayer for your family and for our church for this week. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this passage of Scripture where we're reminded that we always need to come and pray to you, and we ask that we can remember that every day um, and that we can see your goodness in everyday life. Amen. During in-person worship, these plates are passed through the pews so that everyone might touch and remember how wonderful it is that God has given us so many blessings. But unless you pay attention, you'll never notice that they say, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How wonderful that not only has God given us many blessings, but also gives us the opportunity and challenges us through God's grace to give of those blessings so that God's mission might be fulfilled in this world. Let us enter this time of offering with hearts focused on giving and God's love. As part of our connectional system, this church annually joins with the Greater Holston Conference to collect a special mission offering. This year, the offering will go to support ministries through local United Methodist churches in East Knoxville, such as through Lennon Sini UMC, where these pictures were taken. The Austin East community is an area of great need and great potential. Monies will be used to address the rise in gun violence, the need for food and nutrition, the need for adequate health care, and the need for adequate housing. Designate your gift as East Knoxville Annual Conference to support our conference-wide effort.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, may this, your word, give us the power to comprehend with all the saints the length and width, the height and depth of the love of Christ and fullness of life in you. Amen. Our scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, starting with verse 14. This is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. As a result of having strong roots in love, I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. Glory to God who is able to do far beyond all that we could ask or imagine by his power at work within us. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations, forever and always. Amen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've made our way to the turning point in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. In the last two weeks, pastors Catherine and Tim have preached on Ephesians chapters 1 and 2, bringing messages of God's unity in the community of believers. God created in himself one new humanity. He brings peace to join together a holy temple where the Lord might dwell. Pastor Tim also reminded us that our doctrine is in service to Christ and his love. Christ's love breaks down the barriers that separate the separates us, and this love compels us to deeper faith, worship, and service. If you missed their sermons, I encourage you to watch them on YouTube this week, because each of my colleagues beautifully set up this first half of the book of Ephesians. In the first two and a half chapters of Ephesians, Really, everything right before our scripture lesson for today, Paul focuses on theology. Now, my seminary theology professor defined theology as the verbal discourse that humans generate about God. It's an interesting framework. Building upon the Latin sermo dei deo, theology is talk about God. God. So the purpose of reading and studying theology is that we might come to understand the grammar of faith and communicate with it. Now this understanding can be a bit limiting as there are many ways to understand God and the grammar of our faith is influenced by our own experiences, but it's an interesting premise. Doing theology, whether we are studying Augustine as the Friends in Christ Sunday School class is, or we're singing a hymn in worship, it gives us a grammar to talk about God. This is really at the heart of the first half of the book of Ephesians. Paul wants the church at Ephesus to develop this grammar and understanding of their new faith. Then we get to today's passage. This is why I kneel before the Father. Our scripture passage today is a hinge. It links both halves of the letter to the Ephesians and provides the turning point. The two are connected and dependent upon one another. Paul's letter to the Ephesians begins with theology. 
He tells the story of what God has done in Christ Jesus, highlighting the pieces of God's story that connect with the concerns of the Ephesians. And then in chapters 4 and 5, we read the more practical instructions and considerations Paul shares with this church. First, theology. Then, in the second half of Paul's letter, guiding his readers how to live in a way that is worthy to their faith. The theology and instruction are connected as the instruction is built upon a theological foundation, but there, that there might be continuity in what these Christians believe and do. By believing in a God of peace, they might bring peace. In understanding that Christ brings unity to reconcile all things to God and each other, these Christians might resolve their dis disagreements and divisions. But with these two pieces of theology and instruction, the hinge connecting them is prayer. As I said before, our scripture lesson begins as Paul is writing, this is why I kneel. He is sharing his reason for prayer. Now commentators disagree about whether he is looking back towards theology or pointing forward to his words of instruction as the why. I think Paul's reason for prayer his why, is directed toward what he has already written. In this theology of unity, peace in Christ, and liberation from sins, Paul prays for the church at Ephesus to experience these things. Paul himself hopes for an inheritance of redemption, and that is why he writes this prayer for the church. George W. Stroop, the professor emeritus of theology at Columbia Theological Seminary, writes that prayer stands at the intersection of reflection on what God has done, reflection that can take the form of theology, and obedient discipleship in the world. In this story of salvation that he has already shared, the theological grammar of faith, Paul prays for the Ephesians' ability to encounter Christ. This hinge prayer connects the theology and instruction by highlighting Paul's concern for these individual disciples who make up the church at Ephesus. As they struggle with disagreements and discord, he prays for them to find unity and peace in their faith in Christ. Paul makes the turn from learning the grammar of faith to living out the faith by connecting the two with a prayer for faith. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. As a result of having strong roots in love, I ask that you'll have the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth, together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. This prayer links together a focus on discipleship with a fervent hope for its recipients. It conveys four main requests, that the believer might be strengthened in their inmost being. Christ will live in their heart, that they might develop the power to grasp the enormity of God's love, and finally, that they may be filled with the fullness of God. These four elements feel similar as they encompass important parts in the life of a Christian. They link worship, discipleship, and service. 
Paul prays for these Christians to learn, worship, and serve together. The prayer here provides the connecting hinge between exploring God's story in Christ and becoming part of this story. This past week, the program staff and clergy of Church Street gathered for a time of retreat. We originally called it post-pandemic processing, or PPP, because as a group, we have had little time to explore more fully the impacts the pandemic has had upon the church and each of us. During this time, we both grieved the ways some things have changed, but also celebrated ways we have innovated. As a staff, we are working to chart the course for how we work and minister together, knowing that it will help us walk alongside this church. So in our looking forward, Pastor Catherine reminded us that the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's the first sentence in the Ministry for All Christians section of the Book of Discipline. This is to be our guiding motivation, to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Well, I very recently, in a different meeting, complained that I thought this phrase was overused, over-encompassing, and meant so many things that it meant nothing. I have to believe that the Spirit was speaking to me through Pastor Catherine because I'm eating my words now. I still think this phrase is over-encompassing, and maybe that's the point. It is large, which helps us see how our lives fit into this greater mission. And feeling like it means so many things, this mission gives space for our various vocations from God to belong under the larger umbrella. This mission is to help us understand our lives in the context of God's mission to the world. Paul's prayer begins with the reminder of his why. He prays and instructs the people of Ephesus because of how God has been revealed to him in Jesus Christ. The why is already answered. Your why is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It's a rally call to join together for one purpose larger than any one of us can do on our own. We are to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world because we are disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is not about getting new members to the church or developing giving units to support the church budget. Christ sent out the disciples to make more disciples, not develop givers through a stewardship campaign or boost the yearly membership figures. Yes, those are important elements that make the work of the church possible, but our why is because we are disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The why is answered. You're already developing the theological grammar of faith. So what do you do? I would love, if nothing else this week, that you would be able to, for yourself, Fill in the blank of this sentence. I blank because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I volunteer at Wesley House because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I sing in the choir because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I call homebound fellow disciples because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. 
I volunteer to teach kindergarten Sunday school. I mentor young children by being a reading buddy at an elementary school. I am taking the covenant or disciple Bible studies. I spend time in prayer and read scripture daily. I knit prayer shawls for the hurting. I call people for the benevolence team. I clean up trash while walking in my neighborhood. I volunteer with mental health advocacy groups. I blank because I am a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. What is it that you do to worship, learn, and serve because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? Will you join me as we proclaim our faith using this affirmation of faith with wording from Ephesians chapter 2. Let us declare our faith in the resurrection and reign of Christ. By his mighty power, God raised from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ and seated him at his right hand in heaven. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything, everywhere and always. Amen. pray. We give you all thanks and praise, O God, for we are overwhelmed by the length and breadth, height and depth of your mysteries, your glory, and your love for us in Christ. We are so quick to look on the outward and make judgments. We judge ourselves. We want to change our bodies, our appearance. We make decisions about others based on their looks and their abilities. Forgive us for our emphasis on outward appearances. Give us the courage and the vision to look inside ourselves. May our inner spirits, who we are, be so rooted and grounded in you that our outward expressions, our words, our actions, our motivations, are reflections of your grace. You have been so generous with us, Lord, and yet we grasp for things that are not needful, not helpful, not useful. We grasp for things that make us appear stronger when our strength is in you. We grasp for status when you have already called us good and beloved. We grasp for more when you have given us enough. You have called us to be the body of Christ, knit together as one people. It is our prayer that we would be a fellowship of unity knowing that we all share the same purpose, the same faith, the same forgiveness, and the same grace. Being rooted in your love, may we grow into faithful followers of Jesus Christ. In your Son, Jesus, you have given us the Savior we longed for. Though he was crucified by the corrupt, you raised him to life, and he comes to us again, striding over chaos and death, dispelling our fears with a love beyond comprehension, strengthening us in our inner beings, and bringing us safely to the land of our destiny. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. 
and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During Vacation Bible School a few weeks ago, the vector verse or memory verse that our children learned actually came from our scripture lesson today. So I wanted to share with you as a blessing and benediction the motions and verbs that we learn together so that you might learn and remember this important part of doxology and celebration from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So get your hands ready. Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we can ask or imagine by his power at work in us. Can you do it with me again? Glory to God, who is able to do far beyond all that we can ask or imagine by his power at work in us. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs>